Hello, everybody. Uh, I am very happy today to be talking to Kanyela Ng. So Kanyela Ng is running for Congress. He's um, a little bit of a superstar, if I don't say so myself. You've made uh, quite a name for yourself at such a young age. You're you're 29, right? Yeah, 29. Younger than me, and you're uh, you're already a, you're already a politician. So you are um, in the Hawaii House of Representatives. Uh, you represent the 11th district, which is South Maui. Um, did you hear a little bit of feedback in your ear or no? I just, I heard my voice talking back to me. Just wanted to make sure everything's good on your end. Put headphones on if you like. Mm. Doesn't matter. I just wanted to make sure you could hear me because I was getting a little echo of myself. But, um, so we'll talk policy in a little bit. But before we get into that, um, tell everybody a little bit about, um, why you got into politics and about your last race, because I know you had quite a story. How did you win your last race at such a young age and how did you get out the vote? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I fight for working families because I come from one and you know, when you're, when you're working class in like one of the most richest places in the world in Hawaii um, and you're native Hawaiian, you don't have to find your way into politics. It kind of finds you, it threatens your existence so very early on, I was exposed to, um, you know, activism and those sorts of things. And then uh, in college, I was a first generation college graduate. Uh, we had this Republican governor who tried to cut our university by like $130 million. So my brother convinced me to run for student president for whatever reason. And uh, we, we won. And um, it was like, it was weird because my opponent, his dad gave him like $4,000 to run a student campaign. Wow. Uh, he was like part of this huge frat and the whole frat was helping him. Uh, but uh, we squeaked by and passed like our first socialist policy or finalized it, which was uh, bus passes were $400 at the time, but like only poor students needed them. Uh, so we made it so everyone ship in $10 and everybody get a bus pass. Uh, and people loved it, you know, even the, even the rich kids loved it. And, you know, we did a lot of things. And then I realized like, hey, this is something I could do. So then um, when a Tea Party guy got elected in my home island when I was 23, I was working at Four Seasons at the time, cleaning locker rooms and the weight room from like 4 a.m. to noon full-time shift. And I just knock on doors till sunset. And uh, uh, we somehow won, despite not having much money. Like he grossly outspent us, and we won by 15, uh, 26%. Wow. And I had to personally knock on over 15,000 doors. So I had to wear out all these shoes and... Um, but you know, that's, that's what works. Like this, this, this economy is not working for a generation, but, um, organizing is, and really knocking on doors is the only way to build a movement or the best way to build a movement. So of course, as a justice Democrat, you're taking no corporate PAC money. Um, but what I find fascinating, and this was obviously the same for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is that. Um, I was naive as to how much like actual groundwork goes into campaigning. Like you were literally, uh, I heard the story that you guys had to hop uh, fences to go knock on doors. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, you do everything you can. Like you wanted to, the only way you're going to win as a grassroots candidate is like when, when elections, when the, the uh, polls close, you got to know that you've left nothing on the table. Like you gave it your all. Uh, so by any means necessary, uh, I mean, we didn't, we didn't get violent, but, uh, <laughs> by you know, almost you, all means necessary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, you gotta be extremely resourceful. Like, like our, I use the piece that I use to mail, um, to walk and I just like, you know, punch a hole in it and put a rubber band in every single night and I write letters on each door knocking piece. Um, personally, like Aloha, um, Kalinsky family, I'm like, I'm here to listen to your concerns and I'll sign it and leave my cell phone at literally at every door. So it's like that personal touch that's going to win people over. And just cause like when you're, when you come to a door, they can be have Fox news playing, um, and extremely conservative. But if you're, if you're, you can't say you're not hardworking and they can't say you're not listening. So when it's just them in the polling booth, it's just them and their conscience, even if they're like obsessed with their real view, they know who you are and they never met the other person. They're probably going to vote for you. And that's what Democrats have failed to do for, for years. We've like written off all these red states that were originally that they're people that are like come from union backgrounds and stuff. And uh, we got to reconnect and speak to their needs. And that's what justice Democrats are doing. 
Yeah, it's um, it's really interesting because I've I've maintained for a long time that I think populism wins everywhere. And, you know, you touched on it there with uh, people with union backgrounds. And we saw it just happen in West Virginia with the teacher strike. The idea that Democrats should write off states like West Virginia when it's almost like they're just they're waiting for populist Democrats, grassroots Democrats, you know, people funded Democrats to step up and represent them. So this is really an opportunity more than anything in the age of Trump. And I love uh, I went to your website and I want to read everybody the quote you have on the top of your page, because I really like this. And this is not something that you hear in Washington, D.C. In fact, the, I think that it's the opposite philosophy that's dominant among Democrats in Washington, D.C. But you say, uh, quote, it's not enough to simply resist Donald Trump. People are struggling and feeling left behind. Leaders must offer hope and progress beyond resistance. So can you speak a little bit about that? What policies um, would uh, point to this conclusion? Well, we are campaigning on the policies that United Progressives in 2016, like tuition-free public college, Medicare for all, ending reckless wars. Uh, but we're also pushing the envelope for student debt cancellation to save our economy and give our generation a shot. Um, universal basic income, a Green New Deal, which would be 100% uh, renewable energy uh, nationwide by 2035 through a federal jobs guarantee. Um, and just kind of uh, you know, pushing as far as we can go because these are things that people need. These are actual solutions um, and these half measures just aren't working. Um, and the only reason why Democrats are really afraid of big ideas is because they're afraid of big donors. So, um, you know, when you're unmoored from those corporations, you can just really just speak the truth. And um, it's been really encouraging to see the type of responses we've gotten back. Today, I just rolled out our the nation's first housing for all proposal. Um, and, you know, people are super excited about it. Yeah, that, you know, I'm happy you brought that up because there's a few policies that are actually unique and specific to you among all the Justice Democrats that I think uh, really, and no, di no offense or disrespect to any of the other Justice Democrats, because I think they're all great. But I think um, there's a reason why you really resonated um, amid a whole cadre of superstars because you added some specific things to your platform and had specific proposals that really are bold. And I know that when when uh, I, you know, along with Jank Uger of TYT, when I uh, discussed your campaign when you launched on my show, and I always give the link, okay, if you want to donate, here's the, you know, the website for whichever Justice Democrat it may be. I know that um, you actually did it got more than anybody else because I think they saw those really bold proposals and they were like, wow, this guy's the real deal. So um, one of those that I wanted to talk about, so universal basic income, you just touched on it there. You say on your website, automation and globalization are already disrupting our economy and we must act quickly and explore innovative solutions to build a future economy that leaves no one behind. Studies and pilots demonstrate that $1,000 a month basic income to every resident would grow the American economy by $2.5 trillion. And I know that you also uh, speak a lot about FDR's Economic Bill of Rights. So what what gave you the inspiration? Like, what what is it that made you... Are you just a history buff and you were like, you know what, let me see what it was like back then, and then you were going through the economic policies and the, of the New Deal and you were intrigued? Or what is it that made you realize, like, oh, this is obviously the answer and this is the direction we should go, and this isn't crazy pie in the sky as the right and even some corporate Democrats are going to paint it as? No, I mean, I mean, first of all, thanks for the props, but I just, like, these policies aren't, I mean, they're rooted in history, sure, but they're kind of easy to stumble upon if you just walk outside and, first of all, like zoom out, like like Medicare for All, for example, why do we rely on um, employers to provide our insurance? Like it's, no, no one's happy with that. The employers aren't even happy with that. The employees definitely aren't. Uh, it's like a broken system. Um, doctors hate it. They gotta do more paperwork than spend time with patients. Um, so if you just think of, like, just kind of look back a little, um, there's so much work to be done outside, right? There's like trees to be planted, bridges to be repaired, um, roads or bridges to be built, roads to be repaired, and it's just these, the private sector is just not meeting that demand. And meanwhile, there's um, un unemployed all over the US, or there are people that, like we have a really low unemployment rate, but it's because our jobs don't pay enough. So people are working two or three jobs and folks stop looking, 70% of my classmates moved to the mainland. So, um, you know, 
why aren't we just providing those jobs to everyone? Um, livable jobs through a, through a federal jobs guarantee. Like it's very simple to, to to come up with these solutions if you just approach it from like a common sense perspective. Um, same as like climate change. Like if they say we need to reduce emissions by this much, let's just let's just get there. Let's just demand that corporations stop polluting so much and you know that we stop making electric cars by a certain year by 2030 uh, i mean stop making fossil fuel cars and stop those pipelines like it it's very common sense it's just the only reason why we don't think it is and people say it's impossible or radical is because the donors are spewing that propaganda yeah and i think um an interesting point about that, I think, is that it would actually help the economy if we get off of fossil fuels. I mean, obviously, there's the benefit of you're going to fight back against climate change, which is just absolutely necessary and not debatable at this point. But also, I think it'll help the economy because the next boom, you know, is going to be in uh, green and renewable technology. And why not do a new New Deal and have that be at the forefront of that? Yeah, and this Green New Deal that we've been championing, uh, along with the federal job guarantee, it's been picking up, and you see more and more Justice Democrats and other candidates uh, running on it now as well. And that's a good point. Like All of our policies, it's not like anti-growth. Uh, They're actually all pro-growth. And if you, and they cost less than the, the proposals we, we're looking at now. Like Under Medicare for All, people will be paying um, like half as much as they do under the private sector. Yep. And sure, it's taxes, but who cares? You're, there's going to be more money in your pocket and you're going to have better outcomes. Right. No uh, more and, private premiums and then your taxes go up, but you're still net paying less is the point. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the thing about the profit. When you commodify our basic rights and you put profit in the mix, everyone, every layer, you need to add profit and that balloons the cost. Like it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, but and, and when it comes to like housing in, in Hawaii, like, I'm looking at my window right now. There's like luxury condos every month popping up and it's like $20 million for single units getting sold. So this idea that we don't have enough money on this island or resources to solve our housing problem is absurd. Like just look outside. Scarcity is a political choice and all we need to do is is like demand that the money stop getting siphoned out by out-of-state investors and we build for human need rather than speculative um, profit. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always felt like if the news media was doing its job, every American should be able to tell you, um, hey, there's about half a million um, homeless people in this country. And they should be able to tell you there's about 50,000 or 60,000 homeless veterans. But they never, nobody can tell you that. And it's not their fault necessarily, because it's not like those people, it's not like the American people don't want to help homeless people and don't want to help homeless veterans. It's just that we're not educated on this stuff. And I feel like what we've lacked in the Democratic Party and in our politics is a strong voice for uh, working families and a strong voice for um, the poor and, and homeless people. And I really like how you're talking about this housing for all idea. Um, you know, one of the things I, I spoke about this on my show a while ago, and this is one of those facts that it just uh, my mind is absolutely blown by it, and it's, again, blown by the fact that this isn't widespread knowledge and people don't already know this, but apparently, if you just uh, leave a homeless person on the street and say, you know what, to hell with you, we're not going to help you, there's going to be no government action here, that costs $31,000 per year. Now, if you uh, do a program where you actually just give homeless people housing— that that mean that would only cost ten thousand dollars a year. So you save twenty thousand dollars a year. So, I mean, look at this. It's so we know that it's morally the right thing to do. It's ethically and morally the right thing to do to address this. But it's also fiscally the right thing to do. So this gets back to what you were saying about how, I mean, this is it. It really is common sense. It, like the Justice Democrats platform and even the things that you've gone above and beyond and put in your platform. It strikes me like. Anybody, when they hear this, left or right, Republican or Democrat, any voter is going to go, that's what I want to, that's what I want right there. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, there is such thing as like systems trying to turn people against each other and scapegoating other populations. And psychologically, sure. if you're struggling, um, it's easier to blame like people even worse off than you than it is to be to blame the people that you admire, who you want to be. Um, so, 
you know, they make us fight over crumbs under the table while they sit up there and eat the whole pie. And that's how Donald Trump won, right? He identified the pain. He's like, I see you struggling. But he blamed Muslims and immigrants. Yep. And really, it's people like him. It's billionaires and oligarchs um, that's causing the problem. So people, th- there are sections of like working people um, all across our communities who do want to blame the house list for their own problems. Um, but that's why it's important that we get out there and organize because um, otherwise they're only hearing one side of it. And when Democrats try to run to the right, um, especially in these red states or red areas, even in Hawaii, uh, we, um, you know, they have to choose between Republicans or Republican lights. They choose Republicans and the people who are on our side just stay home. So we got to excite folks, get them out, get them knocking on doors with us, talking to their neighbors, having those meaningful conversations and not just buying TV ads. And that's the way we're going to build a movement and um, kind of restore that uh, that heart and soul to not just um, the Democratic Party, but to working people um, of any affiliation. Yeah. So you you made an interesting point there. You touched on a group of people that I call the TFGs. It stands for too far gone. Um, they exist. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but what you mentioned correctly that the middle class, the oldest trick in the book is elites get the middle class to hate poor people and people right. of color and immigrants and the other. And it really is the oldest trick in the book. It's divide and conquer. Um, but I've always thought that um, the the too far gone contingent of the American population is probably maximum, maximum 30% of the country, maybe even 20 or 25%, which means that there's a voting block there where obviously you can get run-of-the-mill Democrats to support your, your, you know, your philosophy, your ideology, and what you're pushing for, but also independents and also people who would describe themselves as conservative, but they're actually more populist and would be would not even the right label when they say, oh, I'm conservative. So do you agree with that? Do you think that the policies that we push for, the division is so strong that it would almost lead to flawless victories to steal from Mortal Kombat? <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, I, I I do, um, and there'll be a lot less fatalities. <laughs> well said, well said. Um, so, I just one more thing here. I want you to talk a little bit more about the job guarantee. So, I didn't know this, but apparently, um, FDR when he did the New Deal, he almost hit a hundred percent employment. Is yeah, it, I mean, this con- something that's on your website. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing about, um, like, when people say, like, how are we going to afford these things? When we invest in the working class and we build it up to the middle class and we build the middle class out, um, our economy booms. Like, that creates, like, people spend that money. It's not like when you give to the rich and you give tax cuts and they just hoard it in all share or short accounts or buy back stocks. Like, when working people get money, they get haircuts, they get groceries, um, they keep the economy going. Our economy runs on spending, right? So you put money that's sitting in government coffers, you put it back in the economy, and it, it's it runs at its full potential. Um, so our economy was at its best when we were investing the most in in the working class. And so, so you know, a lot of these policies, like a federal jobs guarantee, universal basic income, it, it's all based in that empirical historical fact so um final question talk a little bit about foreign policy um what are your thoughts on the situation in iraq what are your thoughts on the situation in afghanistan and what should happen with uh, u.s foreign policy moving forward uh we spent 5.6 trillion dollars on iraq and afghanistan uh that's that's absurd like we could have college and Medicare and housing uh, for everyone with that kind of money. Um, But, uh, you know, I think it's good when folks talk about anti-interventionism, but anti-imperialism is even better. And frankly, I haven't heard any American politician talk about it. That's right. Uh, so we're trying to we're trying to start it out. Like as Native Hawaiians, we know what it's like to be displaced from our homeland. Like we're in economic and environmental exile today. There are more Hawaiians living outside our state than here. So, um, you know, whether it's a war on drugs or a war on terror or a war for whatever hell reason the White House makes up, it's a war for profit. And it's a war that's causing indigenous people all over the world to suffer just like we have. So, you know, this immigrant 
problem that's not really a problem economically that um, Trump likes to scapegoat. We cause that stuff. We, most of, most of these things are American induced, and uh, you know it's our responsibility to to let them in um, and stop these reckless wars that are just making um, not just other other nations but our own nation um, worse off, uh, both economically and morally. Okay, that's great. Uh, um, every time. Um... I hear you talk. I'm more and more inspired. I wish I could vote for you, but I can't because I'm in New York. <laughs> um, so, Kanyela, tell everybody how they can donate to your campaign and how they can help you. Sure. Uh, KanyelaNg.com. Um, we don't take any corporate money or any money from lobbyists. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the trick, right? Everyone says they're against Citizens United. That's easy. Um, the repeal Citizens United pack is like this this like laundering scheme now for, for um, certain consultants. So um, what what's more important is like you actually reject um, money from like all those folks um, who are involved on, on that side. Um, and we rely on working people. So I think our average donation is around $30, uh, 7,000 individual contrib- contributors, six times. We broke the record by like three to six times. I think, I think the record was around 1,500 individual donors um, in our district. So um, we're doing it differently. And I know that the people who give don't have a lot. So... Um, you know, it means a lot. And, but that's really what it's about, right? I'm a movement candidate. It's not about like who's the most qualified. It's like who's going to uh, take our ideas forward and um, give our generation a shot. And frankly, I'm so sick of the rhetoric from the, like, the Democratic Party where they talk about like leaving a better future for our kids. Like, sure, I'm, I'm all about that. I have a two-year-old son. I, I want him to have a shot to make it in Hawaii. But don't write off our generation. Like we still have a shot. Like my great-grandparents, when they rose up from the plantation – um, and they stood up to the corporate establishment of their time. It wasn't just about the next generation. Like they want their chains off their ankles, you know. Um, and we can take. We can have a better future now. We can forgive student debt. We can um, have housing that we can actually afford and healthcare. And um, live in a world where having kids isn't just for the rich. Uh, and you know, we just got to demand it and rise up. So. Um, Please chip in. Uh, if you go to events, there's like phone banking. There's all kinds of things you can text banking, all kinds of things you can do remotely as well if you're not in Hawaii. And you know, if, as a final point, I just want to say I think the difference in my mind between you and most of the dem- already elected Democrats is that when you talk, it's not just platitudes and cliches. When most elected Democrats talk, I just hear stuff like "Let's create a better future." And yeah, okay, but how do we go about doing that? What exactly do you want to do? What are your policies? They 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 just you know leave it open, and you're supposed to fill in the blanks with whatever you want. You're very specific in what you want, and even if some people might disagree with a policy or two uh, that you propose, I think when push comes to shove, the reality is everybody knows that you're fighting for them, and you have uh, just a litany of fantastic things that you're pushing for. And the specifics is, is what I personally love more than anything. So I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I wish you all the best in your race, and uh, we'll talk again in the future. No, thanks so much, Colin. Let me say, um, you know, when you speak against donors who control our government, you're also speaking against advertisers who control our media. Uh, so, um, you know, that's part of the problem as well. So thank you for doing what you're doing as an independent voice and being a part of our movement. My pleasure, man. Thank you very much. All right.